Hey everyone, welcome back to the shop. So one of my favorite chapters in Foundations of Ultra Precision Mechanism Design by Smith and Chetwin is chapter six, Lever Mechanisms of High Resolution. This is one of my favorite parts about precision engineering and machining is what he describes here as the term leverage. It's taken very widely to encompass all scaling devices that help improve the control of property values. Mostly here, this involves means of translating a macro scale action to a micro scale event. It's really fun to be able to, you know, turn a knob, take a human input, and translate that down to a micro inch scale or even nanometer scale displacement. And that's what this chapter covers in all sorts of different um, contexts. But today we're going to be talking about just simple linear motion lever mechanisms. I've come up with one uh, that I've not seen done before, so I'd like to uh, just throw it out there and see if anyone's uh, seen something similar. But a couple seconds of background. There's kind of a couple different ways of doing it. Well, there's more than a couple, but two main ones or two common ones is right here. If we're just, if we're just using a simple flexure-based um, translation system and we want to, you know, have some sort of lever reduction, you can just do a simple lever, right? A ratio of two different lengths and a pivot. There's a couple different orientations you can do that in, but you obviously get a transmission ratio equal to the uh, ratio of lengths. This works great, super simple, but for extremely high uh, lever ratios, this becomes sort of impractical because you need huge lengths and very small lengths and Sometimes the flexures can't really fit in those scales, or it becomes impractically large. Another kind uses a ratio of stiffnesses, or springs, uh, to actuate small displacements where you have, where you push on or displace a very squishy spring, and then you have a stiffer output stage, and that displacement on the uh, relatively low stiffness input spring exerts a small force on the high stiffness output spring, which translates to a small displacement. And these are neat, but they're not always, I don't know, the most deterministic, if you will. Uh, what I came up with falls somewhere in between. What I wanted is a uh, very high ratio capable lever mechanism, but I wanted it to be able to be designed off of length ratios instead of stiffness ratios. So let's take a look. All right, here it is. Not really, but this explains the concept well enough. I'll show you the actual prototype I made in a second. Let's say we have a long cylinder beam that you know is decently well modeled by standard Euler Bernoulli beam theory. And I support it in the way that you, that a diving board is supported. That's what I'm calling this is the diving board lever me mechanism, where in the back we have a pin, and somewhere along the length we have a uh, just a pivot or a fulcrum. If you displace the end of the diving board by jumping on it, as you can see, and this is obvious, we also have a displacement here in the opposite direction. It also is very obvious the magnitude of these displacements is very different. So how can we harness this to make a lever mechanism? So we clearly have some sort of large uh, reduction in motion between those two points, uh, but it's clearly not you know, a linear uh, lever ratio. So in order for it to be useful to us as engineers, we need to know, or at least have a general idea of what the transmission ratio of that sort of uh, mechanism might be. And luckily, we can do the math, and here's what we get. So for a beam supported in the way that uh, I described, if we call the shorter length between the pin and the fulcrum L1 and the rest of the length out here L2, the transmission ratio, or the ratio between the displacement at the end of the uh, beam and the opposite displacement up here is this equation you see here. So yeah, it turns out that it's not linear at all. If you rearrange this, uh, it becomes clear that the ratio 
L2 to L1 is, is squared uh, and shows up a couple times. But this is pretty powerful because in a relatively small package, uh, we can fit a much larger uh, reduction than if we had just, you know, used this as a seesaw and got, you know, maybe a three to two reduction. And taking the idea a step further, if you have a way to actuate your uh, fulcrum here, you can have this act as sort of a coarse slash fine stage where you can provide an actuation here and get basically a uh, two to one reduction. And then once you get your uh, displacement close, you can then lock the fulcrum and actuate out here to get a much higher resolution uh, displacement out at the end. So let's look at a prototype. All right, so here's a little prototype I came up with. This is just a water jet monolithic part out of half inch steel here. And it's real simple. There's a four bar uh, flexure stage right here. And this serves as the output. I have an LVDT gauge uh, reading against that. And this is the uh, direction that we're interested in measuring. Here's our mechanism. And I keep saying mechanism. It's really literally just a bar. Uh, it's linked to this stage with this little link here. The bar uh, pivots about this crossed leaf uh, flexure joint. It's two uh, blade flexures that uh, come together at an angle, and then you get a center of rotation where they meet. Um, we've got two actuator screws here. We have a horse adjust. This is the fulcrum, but it can also be actuated. It's just a quarter 20 bolt with a hardened ball pressed into the end. And then this other screw here and the slot just serve as an anti-backlash adjustment so I can remove any play in the screw. And then up top, the way I've done this is I have the same exact uh, arrangement uh, complete with the comically large knobs. Um, but here the screw is driving a pin, a spring-loaded hardened pin uh, that's floating in a hole in the end of the uh, bar here. So you can see I can screw this around, but it's just pushing that pin back and forth. But this is still free to, uh, free to move around. There's a little set screw though. So when I come in and tighten the set screw, it locks it to the pin. And now when I turn the knob, we actuate the whole uh, bar and cause it to bend. So the idea is you adjust the coarse knob, get it sort of in the neighborhood of where you want it, then snug this up and then you have your fine adjust up here. So I realized I forgot to actually mention the ratio of this particular example here while I was filming that segment. Um, and it's also worth mentioning why our experienced ratio is not going to be exactly uh, what the equation predicts. But for this particular prototype, we have a distance between the pivot point and the fulcrum of two inches, and then from the fulcrum to the far end of the bar of four inches. And when you plug that into the equation, you get a reduction of 32, uh, which is pretty good. Uh, if you were to move this fulcrum down one inch and then you know have the output be right here at a half inch, you then have L2 to L1 of five, and now the reduction would be 160. So you can see how this, you know, this equation kind of goes goes up pretty fast and you can pack some huge, huge reductions into a small package. Now the math says 32, but we obviously won't see exactly 32. There's a couple reasons for it. Um, first of all, well, let's see, you know, this thread up top, the screw we're driving with is a quarter 20 screw. So we have a 50 thou lead. One revolution here is a 50 thou displacement here. And that gives us here at the output of one and a half thou, or it's 1.5625 thou uh, on the output. Um, we won't see exactly that because right here where we have a frictionless pivot modeled in the equation, we actually have a flexure pivot, so this will provide some sort of reaction moment. And then 
you also have the elastic reaction of this beam bending pushing the whole frame out. You've got the LVDT mounted over here. Obviously, this is not a rigid structure, so that will move away, provide, give us a, a reading of less than we would expect. The reaction moment here will give us a uh, transmission ratio of greater than we'd, we would expect. So in general, we'll probably uh, find that the measured output will be uh, less than we would, we would uh, think we would find if we just multiplied the input displacement or divided the input displacement by 32. We're set up here on the mill just because the vise is a convenient way to hold this and I've got the uh, Edmonds uh, trendsetter gauge set up here connected to our LVDT and that will provide a convenient place to read out our uh, displacement here. Anyhow, we're set up here and I'm going to come in with the coarse adjust knob and start to move the bar and you can see here we are hopping onto scale. Right now we're on the finest range where we were plus or minus one tenth. Uh, and that means the finest divisions here are two micro inches uh, per tick. You also have a readout down here of the actual uh, displacement. So this, you know, given the four inch knob, the uh, CMD lubricated bolt, the ball end, we actually get a fair amount of adjustability with this knob. Um, but it's still not quite as sensitive as we might like. So here's the idea of the coarse fine here. We'll get it just on the end of the range here. Go ahead and snug up our fine adjust set screw. And now when I turn this top knob, you can see there is a massive amount of reduction. So. I'm turning this thing a solid 30, 45 degrees, and it's not even, it's going maybe half, half scale here. Um, but if I you know, make small adjustments, you can see I'm able to absolutely split two micro inches. We're really limited by the display here. I'm confident if we had a, a more precise uh, displacement sensor, I could get down into the sort of 10 nanometer range or half micro inch. But this is a really smooth, excellent way of adjusting. Um, and come up here, zero it out, just like that. And to give an idea of just how small of a displacement that is, I mean, just dragging my finger on top of the, on top of the frame here, or pressing on this part of the frame, these are showing displacements far larger than I can adjust to with this knob. So this is a really, really neat, sensitive adjustment mechanism here. Well, hopefully this was interesting. I don't really know what a great use for this thing is. Uh, I'm sure you could shrink it down to, to a more compact form where it was more easily integrated in something. And I'm not necessarily arguing that this is better than any other type of adjustment mechanism. I'm sure I'll get a thousand comments about differential screws. That seems to be the trend uh, whenever I show off something that can move a small distance is people yelling about differential screws in the comments. I like differential screws, I just haven't used them recently. Anyhow, hope you guys found this interesting and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.